sandwich in between that of a Hebrew rabbi and that of a staff commander who had written a monograph upon the deep sea fishes. Let me see, said Holmes. Huh. Born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Contralto. Mm-hmm. The Scala. Hmm. Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Yes. Retired from operatic stage. Ha. <laughs> Living in London. Quite so. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so. But how? Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? None. Then I fail to follow your majesty. If this young person should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? That is the writing. Pooh, pooh. Forgery. My private notepaper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. We were both in the photograph. Oh, dear. That is very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. I was mad, insane. You have compromised yourself seriously. I was only Crown Prince then. I was young. I am but 30 now. It must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen then. Five attempts have been made. Twice, burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once, we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice, she has been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it? Absolutely none. Holmes laughed. It is quite a pretty little problem, said he. But a very serious one to me, returned the king reproachfully. Very indeed. And what does she propose to do with the photograph? To ruin me. But how? I am about to be married. So I have heard. To Clotilde Lothman von Saxemengen, second daughter of the king of Scandinavia, you may know the strict principles of her family. She is herself the very soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler threatens to send them the photograph, and she will do it. I know that she will do it. You do not know her, but she has a soul of steel. She has the face of the most beautiful of women and the mind of the most resolute of men. Rather than I should marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go, none. You are sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed. That would be next Monday. Oh, then we have three days yet, said Holmes with a yawn. That is very fortunate. As I have one or two matters of importance to look into just at present, Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly. You'll find me at the Langham under the name of the Count von Klam. Then I shall drop your line to let you know how we progress. Pray do so. I shall be all anxiety. Then, as to money, you have caught Blanche. Absolutely. I tell you that I would give one of the provinces of my kingdom to have that photograph. And for present expenses, the king took a heavy chamois leather bag from under his coat and laid it on the table. There are 300 pounds in gold and 700 in notes, he said. Holmes scribbled a receipt upon a sheet of his notebook paper and handed it to him. And Mademoiselle's address, he asked, in Droyany Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John Wood. Holmes took a note of it. One other question, said he. Was the photograph a cabinet? It was. Then good night, Your Majesty, and I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson, he added, as the wheels of the Royal Brougham rolled down the street. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. Two. At three o'clock precisely, I was at Baker Street, but Holmes had not yet returned. The landlady informed me that he had left the house shortly after eight o'clock in the morning, and so I sat down beside the fire, however, with the intention of waiting him, however long he might be. I was already deeply interested in his inquiry, for, though it was surrounded by none of the grim and strange features which were associated with the two crimes which I have already recorded, still, the nature of the case and the exalted station of his client gave it a character of its own. Indeed, apart from the nature of the investigation which my friend had on hand, there was something in his masterly grasp of the situation and his keen, incisive reasoning which made it a pleasure to me to study his system of work and to follow the quick, subtle methods by which he disentangled the most inextricable mysteries. So accustomed was I to his invariable success that the very possibility of his failing had ceased to enter into my head. 
It was close upon four before the door opened, and a drunken-looking groom, ill-kempt and side-whiskered with an inflamed face and in disreputable clothes, walked into the room. Accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers in the use of disguises, I had to look three times before I was certain that it was indeed he. With a nod, he vanished into the bedroom, whence he emerged in five minutes, tweed-suited and respectable as of old. Putting his hands into his pockets, he stretched out his legs in front of the fire and laughed heartily for some minutes. Well, really, he cried, and then he choked and laughed again until he was obliged to lie back limp and helpless in the chair. What is it? It's quite too funny. I am sure you could never guess how I employed my morning or what I ended by doing. I can't imagine. I suppose that you have been watching the habits and perhaps the house of Miss Irene Adler? Quite so. But the sequel was rather unusual. I will tell you, however, I left the house a little after eight o'clock this morning in the character of a groom out of work. There is a wonderful sympathy and Freemasonry among horsey men. Be one of them and you will know all that there is to know. I soon found Bryony Lodge. It is a bijou villa with a garden at the back, but built out in front right up to the road two stories. Chum lock to the door, large sitting room on the right side, well furnished, with long windows almost to the floor and those preposterous English window fasteners which a child could open. Behind there was nothing remarkable, save that the passage window could be reached from the top of the coach house. I walked around it and examined it closely from every point of view, but without noting anything else of interest. I then lounged down the street and found, as I expected, that there was a muse in a lane which runs down by one wall of the garden. I lent the ostlers a hand in rubbing down their horses and received in exchange tuppence, a glass of half and half, two fills of shag tobacco, and as much information as I could desire about Miss Adler to say nothing of half a dozen other people in the neighborhood in whom I was not in the least interested, but whose biographies I was compelled to listen to. And what of Irene Adler, I asked? Oh, she has turned all the men's heads down in that part. She is the daintiest thing under a bonnet on this planet. So say the serpentine muse to a man. She lives quietly, sings at concert, drives out at five every day, and returns at seven sharp for dinner. Seldom goes out at other times except when she sings. Has only one male visitor, but a good deal of him. He is dark, handsome, and dashing. Never calls less than once a day, and often twice. He is a Mr. Godfrey Norton of the Inner Temple. See the advantages of a cabman as a confidant? They had driven him home a dozen times from serpentine muse and knew all about him. When I had listened to all they had to tell, I began to walk up and down near Briony Lodge once more and to think over my plan of campaign. This Godfrey Norton was evidently an important factor in the matter. He was a lawyer, that sounded ominous. What was the relation between them? And what the object of his repeated visits? Was she his client, his friend, or his mistress? If the former, she had probably transferred the photograph to his keeping. If the latter, it was less likely. On the issue of this question depended whether I should continue my work at Briony Lodge or turn my attention to the gentlemen's chambers in the temple. It was a delicate point, and it widened the field of my inquiry. I fear that I bore you with these details, but I have to let you see my little difficulties if you ought to understand the situation. I am following you closely, I answered. I was still balancing the matter in my mind when a handsome cab drove up by to Briony Lodge and a gentleman sprang out. He was a remarkably handsome man, dark, aquiline, and mustached, evidently the man of whom I had heard. He appeared to be in a great hurry, shouted to the cabin to wait, and brushed past the maid who opened the door with the air of a man who was thoroughly at home. He was in the house about a half an hour, and I could catch glimpses of him in the windows of the sitting room, pacing up and down, talking excitedly and waving his arms. Of her, I could see nothing. Presently, he emerged, looking even more flurried than before. As he stepped up to the cab, he pulled a gold watch from his pocket and looked at it earnestly. Drive like the devil, he shouted, first to Gross and Hankey's in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica in the Edgware Road. Half a guinea if you do it in twenty minutes. Away they went, and I was just wondering whether I should not do well to follow them when up the lane came a neat little Landau, the coachman with his coat only half buttoned and his tie under his ear, while all the tags of his harness were sticking out of the buckles. It hadn't pulled up before she shot out of the hall door and into it. I only caught a glimpse of her at the moment, but she was a lovely woman with a face that a man might die for. The Church of St. Monica, John, she cried, and half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes. This was quite too good to lose, Watson. I was just balancing whether I should run for it or whether I should perch behind her landau when a cab came through the street. The driver looked twice at such a shabby fare, but I jumped in before he could object. The Church of St. Monica, said I, and a half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes. 
It was 25 minutes to 12, and of course, it was clear enough what was in the wind. My cabbie drove fast. I don't think I ever drove faster, but the others were there before us. The cab and the Landau with their steaming horses were in front of the door when I arrived. I paid the man and hurried into the church. There was not a soul there save the two of them who I had followed and a surpliced clergyman who seemed to be expostulating with them. They were all three standing in a knot in front of the altar. I lounged up the side aisle like any other idler who has dropped into a church. Suddenly, to my surprise, the three at the altar faced round to me and Godfrey Norton came running as hard as he could towards me. Thank God, he cried. You'll do. Come, come. What then, I asked. Come, man, come. Only three minutes or it won't be legal. I was half dragged up to the altar, and before I knew where I was, I found myself mumbling responses which were whispered in my ear and vouching for things of which I knew nothing and generally assisting in the secure tying up of Irene Adler, spinster, to Godfrey Norton, bachelor. It was all done in an instant, and there was the gentleman thanking me on the one side and the lady on the other, while the clergyman beamed on me in front. It was the most preposterous position in which I found myself in life ever, and it was the thought of it that started me laughing just now. It seems that there had been some informality about their license, that the clergyman absolutely refused to marry them without a witness of some sort, and that my lucky appearance saved the bridegroom from having to sally out into the streets in search of a best man. The bride gave me a sovereign. I mean to wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. This is a very unexpected turn of affairs, said I. And what then? Well, I found my plans very seriously menaced. It looked as if the pair might take an immediate departure and so necessitate very prompt and energetic measures on my part. At the church door, however, they separated, he driving back to the temple and she to her own house. I shall drive out in the park at five as usual, she said as she left him. I heard no more. They drove away in different directions and I went off to make my own arrangements. Which are? Some cold beef and a glass of beer, he answered, ringing the bell. I have been too busy to think of food, and I am likely to be busier still this evening. By the way, Doctor, I shall want your cooperation. I shall be delighted. You don't mind breaking the law? Not in the least. Nor running a chance of arrest? Not in a good cause? Oh, the cause is excellent. Then I am your man. I was sure that I might rely on you. But what is it you wish? When Mrs. Turner has brought in the tray, I will make it clear to you. Now he said, as he turned hungrily on the simple fare that our landlady had provided. I must discuss it while I eat, for I have not much time. It is nearly five now. In two hours we must be on the scene of action. Miss Irene, or Madame, rather, returns from her drive at seven. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I have already arranged what is to occur. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may. You understand? I am to be neutral, to do nothing whatever. There will probably be some small unpleasantness. Do not join in it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting room will open. You are to station yourself close to that open window. Yes. You are to watch me, for I will be visible to you. Yes. And when I raise my hand, so, you will throw into the room what I give you to throw, and will at the same time raise the cry of fire. You quite follow me? Entirely. It is nothing very formidable, he said, taking a long cigar-shaped roll from his pocket. It is an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket fitted with a cap at either end to make itself lighting. Your task is confined to that. When you raise your cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I will rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope that I have made myself clear. I am to remain neutral, to get near the window, to watch you, and at the signal to throw in this object, then to raise the cry of fire and to wait you at the corner of the street. Precisely. Then you may entirely rely on me. That is excellent. I think perhaps it is almost time that I prepare for the new role I have to play. He disappeared into his bedroom and returned in a few minutes in the character of an amiable and simple-minded non-conformist clergyman. His broad black hat, his baggy trousers, his white tie, his sympathetic smile, and general look of peering and benevolent curiosity were such as Mr. John Hare alone could have equaled. It was not merely that Holmes changed his costume. His expression, his manner, his very soul seemed to vary with every fresh part that he assumed. The stage lost a fine actor, even as science lost an acute reasoner when he became a specialist in crime. 
It was a quarter past six when we left Baker Street, and it still wanted ten minutes to the hour when we found ourselves in Serpentine Avenue. It was already dusk, and the lamps were just being lighted as we paced up and down in front of Briony Lodge, waiting for the coming of its occupant. The house was just as I had pictured it from Sherlock Holmes' succinct description, but the locality appeared to be less private than I expected. On the contrary, for a small street in a quiet neighborhood, it was remarkably animated. There was a group of shabbily dressed men smoking and laughing in a corner, a scissors grinder with his wheel, two guardsmen who were flirting with a nurse girl, and several well-dressed young men who were lounging up and down with cigars in their mouths. You see, 